What's up folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi and in a recent video I talked about how to install and some preliminaries on using Warhammer 40k on Tabletop Simulator and today what we're going to be doing is breaking down all you need to know to actually set up and play a game on TTS. Now I'm going to assume that you have all of the mods that we talked about previously as well as your armies constructed using Yellow Scribe and if that is the case then once you find a game which you can usually do in a community or discord server including my own server you can find a link in the video description description is create a game. Now usually you want to be creating a multiplayer game and inserting a password that you can then give to your opponent to join into. But what we're actually going to be doing today is creating a hot seat game because we need both players seated in order to use some of the features of the 40k mods. This is just for demonstration purposes only. Now once your lobby is created you want to load the FTC competitive map base that we spoke about in the last video. It's going to pop up with this notification. You're then going to choose your player color. The two player colors to play on the table are red and blue, and some functions of the mod won't work if you don't have players in both the red and blue seats. It'll then pop up with this notification, which is for this built-in tablet here, which will actually load some additional tutorial materials if you need them. Once you and your opponent have agreed on the points value and size of the game, you can actually change the battlefield size based on the size that you have selected. Most games will come in this incursion or strike force size, so we're going to select that in the select battlefield size toggle here, and then click confirm for gaming. At that point, we're at the stage that we want to additively load our terrain. Now, this can come before or after we choose our objectives. The order doesn't particularly matter, but what we're going to be doing is selecting a map that we have subscribed to on the Steam Workshop. You can go to tts40k.com maps to find the T5S2 competitive map pool. No bias whatsoever, I swear, but those are the maps that we use for my online circuit. Once you have chosen a map to use, you will simply click the toggle here and click additive load to load it onto the board. If that doesn't look good to you, you can click remove terrain and that will delete essentially everything in this area that it has been designated as a terrain feature. But what we're going to do is click confirm terrain to keep this map as it is. From there, we can now spawn our army in. If you watched my previous video, I talked about how to create armies using yellow scribe and save them as objects. And that's what we're going to do. So let's spawn um, this random space marine army that I have saved. Now, once you click on the spawn button, you can just click on the table and the army will deploy. This sometimes, especially if you have a little bit of latency, this will take a couple seconds and clicking multiple times will spawn multiple copies and then you'll have to delete them and go over it, which can create lag. So just click one time and wait for all of the models to load in, even if it takes a couple seconds. You can then right click to go back to the saved objects menu and just close the menu and your army is ready to go. Now that we have our army spawned, let's talk about some very basic controls for Tabletop Simulator that are going to help you quite a bit. First off is moving the camera around. And I'm assuming that we have the default controls enabled here. And we haven't mucked with anything. Uh, we can move the camera around by holding the middle mouse button and dragging, which will simply pan the camera back and forth. We can also rotate the camera by holding the right click button and dragging as well. So that will rotate it around. Now, if we want to move the camera, we can do so with the W, A, S, and D keys, which will similarly pan the camera. And we can also rotate or tilt it with the arrow keys, moving up and down as we see fit. Sometimes, especially if you are dragging the camera and doing a lot of zooming, the camera can be bound up or can get a little glitchy. If you ever need to reset the camera, simply press spacebar and it will move back to its original position. I'm not 100% sure what the mechanism that causes that is, but pressing spacebar will reset it. Now from there, we can talk about moving our models around. Tabletop Simulator is basically just a physics engine, so your models are simply objects that you can move around the table and literally just use them as game pieces as if they, you were playing an actual game of 40k. Tabletop Simulator really does what it says on the tin. It, it just simulates a tabletop and the rest is, is largely up to you. You can click on a model to pick it up and move it around the table. If you hold left and right click, you will actually drag the model along the table and then impact into things. If you just use the normal left click and hold, it will actually try to move over terrain as long as the auto raise function is enabled. We'll talk about toggles like auto raise momentarily. If you left click and drag, you can select multiple models at a time and you can click to pick them all up and move them together 
as a group. You can also use the left and right click here, but it is a little bit tougher because they will bump into each other if they move into contact with anything. If you are moving a, a unit around, as long as you are holding onto it and you don't want to actually execute that move, you can press escape in order to return your models to their original position. And when you have a group selected, you can use the number line keys. So those are the keys at the top of your keyboard to place them into a different formation. Line on the number line corresponds to the number of ranks deep that you are creating your formation. You can also, while holding on to one or more models, press the Q and E key to rotate them all. For single models, you can just hover over the model and press Q and E key to rotate them. But if you want to rotate an entire group, you can click on them all and they will rotate around whichever model that you currently have clicked on. Now, in order to measure between models and areas of the table, press and hold the tab key. When you move your cursor around, it will measure the distance that your cursor is from the original position the tab was located in, rounding up to the nearest tenth of an inch. If you hover over most models, assuming that their, for their colliders are formulated correctly, and you press tab, you will measure from the edge of their base. The default setting of the game is called snap measuring, which measures from the edge of game components that that you press tab on while hovering over. Hover over another game component, you will measure to the edge of that one. This is easy for easily determining exactly how far away models are, but I will caveat that occasionally, especially for larger vehicles that don't have a good collider or some models that don't measure correctly, you may have to use traditional just table measurement in order to determine your distance from them. If you ever have snap measuring enabled and you want to measure without it, you can press control and tab and you will simply measure from the point of the table that you are on regardless of any models in the way. Now, when you're moving models, a way to easily measure the distance that they travel are called toggles. If you right click on the model, you can find a number of toggles right here. One of them is called measure movement. This is also where you'll find the auto raise toggle that we talked about previously. It starts as enabled as default and is what causes models to bump up over intervening object and terrain features when moving over them. Sometimes if you wanna get them into a tight corner, it is beneficial to disable auto raise in order to make it so that the model just simply bumps up into the corner that you want it to be at and doesn't automatically jump up to the top of whatever object you're nearby. Now, as you can see with that measure movement toggle enabled, every time you pick up and move that model, it will measure the distance that it travels. This can make it very easy to very quickly measure how far you're moving. One thing to keep in mind, however, is that when you left click on a model, it will raise slightly above the ground. So to get an accurate measurement, just remember to both left and right click at the same time to drag them across the tabletop. With that, we'll talk about rolling some dice. And TTS has a very sophisticated dice rolling physics engine, which we're going to be using to roll tons and tons of dice very quickly. And this is a big time saver when playing games of Tabletop Simulator, uh, because we don't have to pick up and roll hundreds of dice when we're attacking with big units that have lots of attacks. As you can see here, we have a couple of dice spawned already. These are simply just physics objects and can be manipulated just like models. If we need to, we can spawn additional dice by clicking the toggles up at the top here, either in sets of ones, twos, fives, 10s or 25s. One thing to keep in mind is that these buttons will take a couple of milliseconds to spawn, so clicking them rapidly can mean that sometimes your dice will spawn slower than you expect them to. So just make sure you give it a little bit of a pause after every time you click to spawn more dice. From here, we can then roll all of these dice. The dice then get sorted by result, which is extremely easy when you're looking at a game like 40k, where you're looking for a target number or higher. In order to sort our results, we can then use these toggles on the sides. The delete option deletes either that row or that row and everything either below or above. This button will toggle whether or not you're deleting all of the numbers equal to or below the row that you're selecting or all of the target numbers above, the minus for below and the plus for above. So in this case, if we were looking for force to hit, for example, we would simply go to our three row and right click delete to delete this row and everything below it. So if we were rolling a billion attacks looking for four ups to hit, we would delete all of the ones, twos, and threes all together, and that leaves us with our successful hits. We can then use the roll all dice button to reroll all of these if we're then looking for a wound roll. Let's say that we need fives to wound. We could do the same process to isolate our fives, and your opponent can even come over and use this to roll their saving throws. 
then allocate their damage as normal. We also have the option to re-roll specific rows. So just like we have the delete buttons here, this roll button will either re-roll all of the dice in that specific row, or if we right click it, re-roll all of the dice above or below that value. So for example, if we were re-rolling ones in this instance, we could just click this row and those ones would be re-rolled and we can then perform the exact same process that we just did. If we wanted to re-roll all ones, twos, and threes, we would right click the three option and re-roll all of those dice. Once we're done rolling all of those dice, we can right click clear mat in order to clear it off. The dice roller also has the ability to perform what are called ordered rolls. These are usually for quickly and accurately resolving damage or feel no pains that have to be technically assigned and resolved individually. In this case, the ordered roll will simply give you the dice in a left to right order. So for example, if I wanted to know if my models passed enough feel no pains to survive a multi-damage attack, I could simply see the order in which I rolled them to tell whether or not they survive. We can also order to roll in sets of two or sets of three based on the damage value of the incoming attack. And a similar thing can be used for damage. If I have a D3 damage weapon, for example, that's hitting a unit multiple times, I can accurately determine the order in which those D3 damage rolls are applied. If you need to manually roll dice, you can do so simply by dragging the dice over the dice roller. As long as they fall in, then they will just simply roll as normal. You can also edit your dice and add different colors of dice. There's a custom dice option to insert a custom dice model into the dice roller so that when you spawn it, you will spawn your custom dice. You can also change the color of your dice by clicking these buttons here. If we select gray, for example, and then spawn, we will be spawning gray dice. Over here are a selection of individual other colored dice in bags. You can simply click and drag on these to spawn dice of that color. This can be useful if you're trying to roll multiple different weapon profiles or something together, or you just want a specific dice for a specific purpose. There are also some other facings of dice, including a D3, which just has a one, two, or three facing. Down in the corner of the dice roller, you'll see a camera. This actually captures your opponent's dice tray. So while they're rolling dice, you can actually watch their results without having to physically move your own camera over there to look at them. So those are the basic controls. Now let's talk about actually setting up the game. There are options in the FTC board to generate missions based on the Leviathan mission deck. You can either randomly generate mission cards, which draws them randomly from the deck, or you can use preset selections of missions from Games Workshop's Leviathan tournament packet if you're playing more competitive games. It will tell you which of the combinations of missions that the packet lists, and it will randomly select you only a combination of those three deployment mission role and primary mission. Once you've done that, you can then display your deployment zone by going down to the deployment zone section and selecting the correct deployment zone. In this case, Dawn of War is what we drew from the card deck. So if we look over here on our board, the objectives are spawned and we have indicators for our deployment zone as well. Once all that's in place, we can move over to locking in our secondary objectives. You can see that there is a selection of secondary objectives that begin the game spawned in each player's hand. This is used to then lock in your secondaries on the scoreboard. As normal, you'll select two of these to use as your secondaries, either the two tactical objectives cards or two of the fixed secondaries if you prefer to take fixed objectives. When you've selected your two, simply flip them over. In this case, I think we'll go with these two. You can press flip to flip over any object that you have selected. This includes models, by the way, so that's kind of fun because you can use that to clearly indicate casualties or just get models out of the way for the purposes of line of sight. Once you have your two objectives flipped over, you'll go over here and click lock in secondaries. That will move the objective cards out of your hand and over onto the scoreboard, where they will be flipped over until your opponent also chooses their secondaries. Once both players have locked in their secondaries, the secondaries reveal and will flip over so you can both see what each other are playing. In this case, we've chosen to take these fixed secondaries. Our opponent has chosen to take tactical secondaries. Then it's time to go to the battle formation step where we determine and leadership attachments, reserves, and transports. This is technically done in secret, and so the board has an option to hide your army for this step. If you look from outside, you'll actually find that there is this big box that spawns on your table half. Any models that you have inside that box are then hidden from your opponent, so your opponent is not able to see what you're doing. You can then go to this sheet over here and place the units that you want to be embarked or in reserve.
curve. This will just typically require that we indicate which of our transports is transport one, two, three, or four, or uh, even more if we go that far, which you can do by simply editing the tooltip of the transport. So for example, over here, we can say that Land Raider Redeemer is transport one, or we can even spawn new text boxes by using the text option right here, clicking on the tabletop somewhere and say Redeemer one, for example. Those are good ways to indicate which of your transports your models are embarked into. After both players have decided all of their battle formations, you can then click the show army tab to then remove that invisible box and your opponent will be able to see where your units have been embarked or placed into reserve. Now it's time to actually start the game and get started playing. This section requires a second player to be present. The mod will actually not work if both players aren't seated. And after the roll to go first, you can click to the player color of whichever player won that roll off, either red or blue. Let's say that we have won the roll off and are taking the first turn. So we're gonna click that the red player is going first and then we're gonna click start game. That then moves all of the tactical secondaries off of the secondary tray, but keeps fixed secondaries if you have them. And you now have a toggle to cycle through your phases. Now moving over to the blue player side here, I'll tell you how the deck function works. We can use these toggles to draw or manipulate tactical secondaries when it comes to our turn to play them. So assuming that we are at the start of the blue player's turn and wanted to draw some secondary objectives, we can click the draw button to then place new objective cards on the tray. If we ever have completed these or need to discard them for any reason, we can use the X button here to then move them to our discard pile. If we get objectives that we cannot complete or that cycle automatically, we can use the recycle secondary button in order to shuffle them back into the deck. This is useful for secondaries like Defend Stronghold that cannot be scored on the first battle round of the game. Depending on what secondaries you have access to, these toggles are handy tools in order to see which areas of the table are important for secondaries. So for example, we can use these toggles to differentiate areas of the table like table quarters, area denial for secondaries like area denial, aptly named, or deploy teleport homers. This circle is three inches from the center and this one is six. We can also see three inches from other table quarters using the show engage toggle. We can show potential areas to strategic reserve in using the strat reserves toggle. We can show nine inches from the table corners using the investigate signals. And last but certainly not least, we can reapply our deployment zones by using the deployment zone toggle. These get pretty clustered if we keep them all active, but we can click them again to simply hide that measurement. That just saves some time having to manually measure that distance every time, especially if you have a fixed secondary that you're trying to complete using that area of the table. Now let's move on to using the scorecard and saying that we're actually completing these secondaries and scoring points, something that I wish uh, I was better at doing. One thing that I like to do a lot is use the picture in picture function to add the scorecard to my screen. That way I can always see what secondaries I'm trying to access and I always know what the score is. This function can simply be accessed by right clicking anywhere on the table that doesn't have a, an object there, uh, either on the tabletop or on the void outside the tabletop and selecting this picture in picture function. It begins unlocked and you'll simply maneuver your camera into a position that you want. And then you can click the lock toggle in order to lock it in place. And once you move your camera, it will stay there. There's a little bit of functionality you can use through the picture in picture camera. For example, if you press alt while hovering over a card, it will zoom into that card or that object in order to allow you to see it. And you can even use the scroll reel to expand it even bigger. So if you ever want access to the secondaries you're trying to complete, that's a super duper easy way to do it without having to manually move your camera all the way back up to the top over here and then zoom into the secondary specifically. When you're scoring your secondaries, the outermost column of the score sheet is your primary objective points. These are capped at 50 points as per the rules. Can't score more than 50 on each. Clicking on the plus button will simply increase your score by one. Right clicking on the plus button will increase your score by five. And the same for the minus button with decreasing. Now this doesn't actually keep track of your primary for you. You have to accurately score your primary. This is simply a calculator to tell you how many points you've scored. For your secondary objectives, you can use the same function. You can click plus to increase your score by one or right click to increase your score by five and the same for decreasing it. These are not capped. So you do have to keep track of which secondaries you are capped on your score of. So for example, for fixed secondaries, we can only score each of these up to 20. So while 
while the system may allow us to go up to 25, we have to make sure that we don't accidentally overscore. The total score is going to be tabulated down to the bottom here, and 10 points for being painted is already added in, because uh, I guess ostensibly the digital models that we're using do in fact have paint on them. Digital paint. Uh, skins, I guess. Up at the top here, we will also get a command point tracker. As player turns progress, the command point tracker will automatically gain you your command phase CP, and if you have other ways to gain command points, you can click the gain a command point button in order to add to that as well. You can also use the toggles down here at the bottom of this calculator to spend or gain command points. While these toggles are unlimited, this gain a CP button is actually limited per battle round, so using that button will not allow you to gain more than one command point each round, as is the rule. Now speaking of battle rounds, we can also use this toggle to move along phases. Left clicking on this button will move between phases, and you will also see that there is a small indicator up in the top right corner that will tell you what phase you're on. If you right click this, it will simply skip the remainder of your turn and move on to your opponent's turn. This is mostly a formality, just telling your opponent what phase you're in. A lot of players will simply move through at their own pace and then use the right click function to pass the turn once their turn is completed. As you can see, passing the turn then gains both players a command point and moves us on to the other player's turn. And they can go through the exact same system in order to play through their own turn. Now, a little bit of a useful tool here are these little guys called activation tokens. You can use control C and control V to copy and paste objects in the game. You can also click this button to spawn new activation tokens. These are nice if you have effects that are usable once per phase or once per turn, or if you simply want to keep track of your units that have fired. In armies that have a million units that all will be shooting ranged attacks or all will be using a once per turn ability, having these activation tokens available for to you is really nice. You can place them out on the battlefield or near your units, and once their activation is completed, you can click the button at the top here to transition them from green or unused to red or used. Once the other player progresses their phase, you'll see that those activation tokens actually reset, meaning that those units are then able to reactivate or their ability has reset. I use these a lot for like once per turn abilities, so I can remember that I've used them, or again, I'll use them if I have a lot of units shooting and I have to remember which ones have actually fired their weapons. If you are playing competitively, you may also be requested to use a chess clock. You probably won't have to worry about this for most games, but many competitive events do require chess clocks if one or both players request them so that the game doesn't go too long. The clock starts at a baseline of two hours. In order to change the time, you can simply hold left click on this button and very much like a regular clock, you'll then see a flashing number that you can then decrease or increase by clicking the left or right buttons respectively. You can then click the middle button to transition the flashing number over and edit that one as well. And once you click that over to the other side, it will automatically populate. Holding down left click on that middle mouse button resets it to that number. And as you can see, the amount of time remaining is available both on this readout and up on your HUD in the top right corner. You can then manipulate the clock either by clicking on the physical object. If you've ever used a chess clock in real life, this is works exactly the same way. Hitting your side will then transition the timer to your opponent's side and it will begin ticking down. They will do the same thing to hit it back to your side. You can also do this by clicking on the actual readout on your HUD. So clicking on the active numbers will transition it back and forth. And you can also do it using the seven or nine buttons on your numpad. The eight button will then pause the time. This mod also includes a bunch of tokens that are useful for a variety of effects, whether you have statistical modifiers, you have your rolls or tests buffed or or debuffed, or you're suffering battle shock, for example. All of these work like bags, kind of like the dice bags that we have over here next to the dice roller. So you can simply left click and drag on them to spawn a new token of that type. You can even, if you want to, use the color tint effect to change the color of the token and click apply to make it easier to differentiate between you and your opponent's tokens. These aren't necessarily required, but they are super useful to keep track of effects over the course of the game. As the game moves on and players use this button to progress the turn, you can see that the battle round tracker will increase every time the second player passes their turn back to the first player. Once that fifth battle round completes, you'll see that little indicator pops up at the top, a little notification informing you of the winner based on the victory points that you have tallied up in the scoreboard. And with that, your game of TTS is over, and I hope it was an exciting and tactically fulfilling experience. Thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. I hope you enjoy your time with Tabletop Simulator 40K. Big shout out to the TTS Battleforge mod team that upkeeps this, and especially Pants999, who has taken 
technique and control of these mods and who is constantly updating them and adding new features to make playing Warhammer 40K on Tabletop Simulator easier. And big thanks as well to everybody who supports me and the Tactical Tortoise channel, either over here on YouTube with a YouTube membership at Patreon at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise or all my Twitch subscribers over at twitch.tv slash tactical tortoise TV. Thanks again for watching. Remember to keep it classy, folks, and have happy wargaming.